The year is 1950 and the Cold War is about to get hot. The communist regime in North Korea is doing everything in its power to conquer the South. In response, the UN and the US send their troops to help South Korea. Just as it looks the US might win, the Chinese enter the war too. The US commander requests permission to nuke them, planning a destruction of strategic targets all over China. These nuclear attacks would have made the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki pale in comparison. Nuclear weapons can be devastating, even in naval warfare, and nukes are a plenty in Battle Warship Naval Empire game, sponsoring this video. This strategy game is free to play, and as a commander you develop your naval base and race to build the most powerful naval fleet. There are over 100 different aircraft carriers available in-game, as well as hundreds of various fighters, bombers, helicopters and other weapons. In Battle Warship you battle real players, but also beat pirates, slay sea monsters and fight in Guild vs Guild Wars. Also, a time-limited Halloween event just began. There are many rare units available, like the Midnight Pumpkin aircraft carrier and the Black Wings fighter. Many wonderful activities await. Install Battle Warship Naval Empires on your mobile device by clicking the link below. Battles on the seas are calling. The Cold War began soon after the end of the World War II. By 1949, the United States assembled a coalition of countries, the NATO countries. The Soviet Union and its allies responded by forming the Eastern Bloc. Throughout the Cold War, both sides avoided direct large-scale conflict. Instead, they relied on espionage, propaganda, diplomacy and similar means. The collapse of the old colonial empires in Africa and Asia created a power vacuum. Both the US and the USSR saw this as an opportunity to spread their influence. Two superpowers used their allies to establish and maintain control through numerous localized conflicts. One of the earliest such proxy wars was the Korean War. In the United States, the Korean War is sometimes called the Forgotten War. It took place after World War II and before the Vietnam War, both of which have a much more prominent place in US history. From 1910, Japanese forces occupied Korea. After Japan surrendered in 1945, the Soviet Red Army advanced rapidly into the Korean Peninsula. Hoping to stop them, the US suggested splitting the control over Korea at the 38th parallel. To their surprise, the Soviets instantly accepted this division. By 1948, both occupied zones became their own sovereign countries. In the south, Americans backed the pro-capitalist Republic of Korea, under the authoritarian rule of Syngman Rhee. He was a Korean nationalist who spent decades leading a provisional government in exile and lobbying for the independence of his country. In the north, the Soviets helped establish the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, a socialist dictatorship under Kim Il-sung. He was a minor guerrilla leader who successfully battled the Japanese in China. Both Syngman Rhee and Kim Il-sung claimed they represented the entire Korean peninsula. Since they refused to recognize the border, this led to frequent border skirmishes, guerrilla warfare and atrocities against civilians. In 1947, President Truman persuaded the United Nations to assume responsibility for the country. However, the US armed forces remained in South Korea. By summer of 1950, Kim Il-sung and his forces were ready for war. With Stalin's blessing and Soviet military equipment, the Korean People's Army began an all-out invasion on June 25th. South Korean forces were badly trained and equipped mostly with US surplus light weapons. By June 28th, the North Korean troops entered Seoul. The South Korean army withdrew behind the defensive line south of Han River. President Truman ordered General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the FICOM, to send supplies to the South Korean army and help protect the evacuation of US citizens. Truman considered declaring war on North Korea, but decided a congressional declaration of war would require too much time. Instead, he turned to the UN for sanctions and support. The UN called for the member states to provide armed assistance to South Korea. Faced with a well-organized and well-equipped enemy, South Korean and US forces had no choice but to retreat. By August 1950, they were forced to the so-called Pusan perimeter, in the southeast of the Korean peninsula. The US used the port of Busan to send in reinforcements. Meanwhile, the US Navy and the US Air Force provided support on the sea and in the air, causing major losses to the North Korean forces. 
General MacArthur believed that to defend the enemy he should strike deep behind their lines. On September 10, 1950, his forces landed in an amphibious assault in Incheon on the western coast of the Korean peninsula. Already weakened, Korean People's Army began retreating, worried it might end being cut off from North Korea. By October 1950, the US, South Korean and the UN forces were invading the territory of North Korea, pushing the enemy forces towards the Yalu River, Korea's border with the People's Republic of China. On October 15th, General MacArthur told President Truman that Chinese intervention was unlikely. Four days later, the People's Republic of China entered the war. Overnight, the odds drastically changed. Numerous, well-trained and decently but lightly equipped, the Chinese army threatened to undo everything the US struggled to achieve. Desperate times asked for desperate measures. And this is where nuclear weapons come in. Mao Zedong was eager to help North Korea, even though other Chinese leaders were reluctant about fighting against the US. Nevertheless, they transported some of their best troops near the border to support the North Koreans if necessary. Chinese also asked the Soviet Union to provide them with air support. Stalin grudgingly agreed. China and the Soviet Union had good reasons to fear antagonizing the United States. Even though the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb in 1949, their nuclear arsenal was still small. Various sources put the Soviet arsenal in 1950 between 5 and 25 nuclear warheads. At the same time, US had between 300 and 450 warheads. US made Mark IV fission bombs yielded between 20 and 40 kilotons, about twice the power of a Hiroshima bomb. Even though Mark IV bombs weighed about 10,000 pounds, B-29 and B-50 bombers could strike targets anywhere in Korea or China from US airfields in the Philippines and Japan. By December 1950, Chinese offensives forced the UN forces below the 38th parallel. In response, General MacArthur demanded access to nuclear weapons. He required 26 atomic bombs to destroy strategic targets across Manchuria, from Antang by the river Yalu to Hanchan near the Soviet border. MacArthur also wanted to utilize four bombs against invasion forces and an additional four to destroy critical concentrations of enemy air power. After initial nuclear strikes, MacArthur would launch a twofold amphibious assault, one in the west and one in the east. The enemy would eventually be annihilated between his forces in the north and the US and UN troops in South Korea. To prevent a future land invasion of Korea, MacArthur's plan envisioned his troops spreading radioactive cobalt from the Sea of Japan to the Yellow Sea, irradiating the northern parts of Korea for at least 60 years. President Truman didn't want to escalate the conflict further. He also didn't trust MacArthur with nuclear weapons. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had similar worries. Gordon Dean, chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, believed MacArthur lacked expert technical knowledge of the weapons and their effects. As for MacArthur himself, he publicly complained about suffering constraints in the way he commanded his forces in Korea. In response, Truman issued a directive requiring all military officers to clear their public statements with the government. By March 1951, the US and UN forces were once again advancing towards the north. The Truman administration began working on a possible ceasefire agreement while planning to halt the US at the 38th parallel. MacArthur ordered his troops to attack beyond that line and then openly criticized Truman's foreign policy in a public communique. All this left Truman with no choice but to officially relieve MacArthur of duty. In April 1951, he was replaced by Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway. Publicly, Truman disagreed with MacArthur about the use of nuclear weapons in the Korean War. At the same time, however, he secretly ordered nine Mark IV atomic bombs to be sent to the US bombers located in Guam and Okinawa. These two decisions weren't at odds with each other. Truman wanted a more trustworthy commander in case there truly comes a moment to use nuclear weapons. So why didn't Harry Truman use those nukes in the Korean War? By the late 1940s, the US defensive strategy already incorporated nuclear weapons. Many US commanders believed atomic bombs were just another new weapon, including MacArthur's replacement, General Ridgway. At the time, the United States still had far more nukes than the Soviet Union, so mutually assured destruction wasn't an issue. The US could have utilized them without worrying about Soviet retaliation. 
Additionally, the government and armed forces enjoyed broad support by the US public regarding both the Korean War and the possible use of atomic weapons. President Truman himself already ordered the nuclear bombing of Japanese cities in 1945. Possibly because of this, Truman said in 1948 that atomic bombs were fundamentally different from other military weapons, since they would primarily target the civilian population. He worried that using them yet again in Asia so soon after Hiroshima and Nagasaki would have undermined the US reputation abroad. More pragmatically, Truman was equally aware that the escalation of the Korean War would force the United States to devote more and more resources there. Meanwhile, American allies in Europe worried that the Soviet Union might use the war as a distraction to strike at them. This would have most likely pushed the US influence out of continental Europe. Or would it, if we only had a video examining such a scenario? Oh wait, we do, sort of. And then there were purely practical problems in using early nuclear weapons. US forces could have tried using nuclear weapons for strategic bombing of targets in China, like factories, airfields, staging areas and depots. Soviet MiG-15 fighter planes probably couldn't have stopped most US bombers. However, the Chinese industry was dispersed while its infrastructure was relatively primitive. Since China was large and populous, it could have continued fighting even after the first nuclear blasts. For it to have any effect, the US bombing campaign would have required many more atomic bombs. While US commanders supported the use of nuclear weapons, they saw the Soviet Union as the primary enemy. In their view, waging a prolonged nuclear war against communist China was a waste of resources. So what about the tactical use of nuclear weapons then? Americans tested that idea. In October 1951, the US launched an operation called Hudson Harbor. B-29 bombers flew from Okinawa to Korea with dummy atomic bombs. In this way, the US wanted to prepare themselves for potential nuclear strikes while also scaring the Soviets away from entering the war. The experiment showed that precision targeting of enemy troops was extremely challenging. Due to the difficult terrain in Korea and the dispersion of troops, nuclear weapons could not live up to their potential. And since the US Air Force pretty much controlled the airspace over Korea, Americans could deal plenty of damage to the enemy even without atomic bombs. In the end, General Omar Bradley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was probably right. He commented that expanding the Korean War into China would have entangled the US in the quote, wrong war, in the wrong place, at the wrong time and with the wrong enemy. Throughout the first half of 1951, Chinese and North Korean troops launched several offensives attempting to once again force their way into South Korea. However, each time joint forces of the US, the UN and South Korea either stopped them or launched a counterattack. On the ground, two sides were evenly matched. While communist troops were more numerous, their equipment was often inferior. Their supply lines were too long and often cut off, leading to a lack of vital necessities like ammunition or food. Chinese repeatedly asked the Soviet Union to send them more equipment. In response, Stalin sent weapons, trucks and fighter jets. At the time, MiG-15 was one of the best fighter planes in the world, however it was roughly evenly matched by the US-made F-86 Sabre. Despite Soviet efforts, Americans controlled the airspace over Korea throughout the war. This made the strategic and tactical use of nuclear weapons unnecessary. The US Air Force could strike targets all over Korean Peninsula using conventional weapons. Simultaneously, Americans could protect their troops and supply lines. Korean War became a prolonged stalemate that lasted two years. During that time, both sides launched new offensives, and yet they both failed in their primary goal, gaining control over the entire Korean Peninsula. The front line remained around the 38th parallel. Over time, Americans grew increasingly frustrated with the seemingly endless stalemate. They became more willing to accept the status quo. Chinese, on the other hand, deliberately prolonged the peace talks, hoping to exhaust the enemy by attacking them on the front and waging guerrilla warfare deep behind their front line. In November 1952, President-elect Dwight David Eisenhower traveled to Korea to see if he could end the Korean War. Unlike his predecessor Truman, Eisenhower was a US general who fought in World War II. Like many other military commanders, he was far more receptive to the idea of using nuclear weapons. Eisenhower even met with MacArthur to discuss the situation in Korea. By 1953, 
The Joint Chiefs of Staff were growing increasingly in favor of using nuclear weapons for strategic bombing, as opposed to previous potential tactical nuclear strikes. One of the reasons for this was the introduction of the Mark VI atomic bomb. It had a nuclear yield of up to 160 kilotons, far more than Mark IV bombs. Besides, by that time the US had enough nuclear weapons to attack both China and the Soviet Union. In May 1953, Eisenhower ordered atomic weapons moved to Okinawa. US diplomats signaled that the government was more than willing to use them against China, if necessary. But in the end, it wasn't the nuclear threat that made the Chinese give up. It was the death of Stalin. Joseph Stalin died in March 1953. Within weeks, the Soviet Politburo voted for the end of the Korean War. Aware that they couldn't pursue the war without Soviet help, Chinese were suddenly more than willing to sign the armistice. The ceasefire began on July 27, 1953. The border between North Korea and South Korea was re-established, with an added demilitarized zone separating the two countries. Truman's decision not to deploy nuclear weapons in the Korean War established a historical precedent. Had the US utilized atomic bombs in Korea, this would have normalized their use in future wars. While the Korean War was costly, the widespread use of nuclear weapons would have been worse. Instead, Truman's decision paved the way for future proxy wars between the US and the Soviet Union. Two superpowers would continue to compete and fight throughout the second half of the 20th century without turning the planet into a nuclear wasteland. As the other countries developed their nuclear arsenals, they followed their example. At least so far. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.